Okay, hello everyone. Time to start the next talk. Uh, my name is Justin Ehrenhofer. Today, I'm going to be talking about privacy adoption, the collision of theory and practice. I'm really looking forward to giving this talk to you all. I think that one of the real things that sets Monero apart from really every other cryptocurrency is the fact that we really take implementation of privacy very, very seriously. And so therefore, this, I think, is a very relevant talk into why Monero does what it does and why this really is, in my opinion, a very important approach um, to protecting the safety of all Monero users. So let's get started. Um, yeah, my name is Justin Ehrenhofer, like I said, and I'm the organizer, uh, one of the organizers at least, of, of Monero Space. So let's get going. So this is not just one of your other talks about why privacy is important. It's not just another talk about the support of privacy. Instead, this is the talk about one specific thing, not Monero generally, but why projects need to take responsibility for privacy technology that they develop, they research, actually being adopted. It is not enough for the cryptocurrency industry to simply say that we are going to try and come together, come up with this really cool implementation. You know, tons of people spending a lot of time putting a really interesting solution together. As an industry, we critically underrepresent the importance of actually implementing these privacy technologies appropriately, correctly, in a way where people actually get the privacy advantages from them. So going through a brief agenda here, I'm going to talk about the difference between privacy theory and practice, then talk about privacy versus coin equality or fungibility as it's often referred to, defense in numbers and how that is really, really important here, how the results and how Monero actually approaches uh, privacy speak for themselves, and then also give some hard truths at the end before going over a conclusion. So lots of fun stuff to talk today. If there are questions, I will be able to address those too. So leave them in chat. I'm watching it. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to keep plowing through. All right, so there's two different things here, right? On the cool side, I mean, it is cool to be like the Monero Research Lab and coming up with a lot of really awesome technologies, right? We got CLSAG. It makes transactions so much more efficient, right, than they previously were. Bulletproofs are great. Triptych is great. The research isn't the problem. You know, research is amazing, and we need additional research in order to keep going. But what's not cool is when this research comes out and then we don't have a really good mechanism of implementing it. If the Monero Research Lab, let's say, came out with Ring CT and Monero just, you know, was like, well, you know, it's cool, but like we'll make it optional or, oh, it's cool, but we'll do this or this or that. And it took a while and everyone dragged their feet and it took forever. That's not really cool. It's not amazing, right? Because now you have this great technology that is completely held back by adoption. So on the right-hand side there, you can see, for example, let's say if CLSAG was for some reason only you know, taken up by a very small number of transactions, there's no reason for that to be the case, right? We should be strongly encouraging people to adopt best practices, for example, using CLSAGs over MLSAGs. And that's why Monero took the approach that it made... CL SAG's mandatory, right? After the hard fork, except for that one pesky transaction, right? Or whatever, whatever it was. <laughs> but yeah, the, the point is the research isn't the problem. The research is the really cool part too. The problem and what's not cool in the industry is when the research really gets held up on, or gets bundled in some really low quality implementation. And so I'm going to be talking about how every project including Monero, has in the past struggled with um, implementation issues. But really, Monero, by and large, seems to be the only coin that actually is taking these implementation challenges very, very seriously. And in the Monero community, we have made implementation really the central focus of how we roll out privacy features. And I think since no one else has yet to do that yet, I think that Monero really is set apart from other cryptocurrencies. So let's go through a few examples here about the difference between theory and practice, right? This is from the Bitcoin Privacy Wiki page. You can go search it, look it up. This is a direct screenshot. And it's a given example of a perfectly private donation, right? It, it is meant to be a very 
you know, a, a perfect example, right? So it's, it's meant to be the best possible use guide for you to follow if you are trying to make, uh, you know, to, to uh, make a, a perfectly private donation. Well, in it, you can see the highlighted steps are a little difficult to follow. For example, they want an average user to download a few extra gigabytes of data over Tor, a few extra hundred gigabytes actually, right? So this is already a pretty steep challenge, asking a user to install a separate browser, go through the process of having it run for a while. We're expecting users to have this run in the background for perhaps several days or weeks so that they aren't fingerprinted on timing alone. So a user already can't follow this guide if they want to make an immediate payment. Now look at option four, or you know, step four though, solo mine a block. Do we really think that any user can actually solo mine a block reliably? The answer is pretty much no in every single case. And in fact, if you could solo mine a block reliably, this is, I mean, it's indicative of the network not being secure, right? And then finally, it says that you should destroy your computer hardware used. So this step-by-step -step guide here, for instance, is a useful tool to carve out what you need to do in theory, but it is, is no way a useful guide for you to give anyone with the expectation that they actually follow it, right? Perhaps if your life depended on this, you would go through every effort to try and solo mine your own block, right? You would buy thousands of dollars of hardware. You would go through extreme effort to try and follow this guide. But in reality, this is not something that is actually achievable by anyone. So you can see here, for example, this is a guide that is useful in theory only. There really is no practical use for this guide. And that's not necessarily a problem as long as people understand that, but it's certainly not something that we can recommend any users follow. In general, let's talk about some other things that people say in theory. Well, we can say that, well, in theory, any user who cares about their privacy, right, needs to do the following. You, you know, you care? Okay, good. You must also now do all these other things. You must spend send a special private transaction, perhaps, or you need to download a special wallet or spend more in fees or wait several days or weeks. You might need to remember to mix your change outputs to, so that you aren't uh, undermining your future privacy, too. You might have to build special sources from code. Uh, sorry, sorry, special uh, code from source. Uh, you may have to handle your own timing of how you span, spend transactions and be really careful about it. Or you might need to denominate funds and be really careful about uh, how you spend or don't spend specific money. And, and then, of course, you can only do this after watching hundreds of hours of videos and reading every single article out there on the topic so that you know you are up to date with the latest public research on how to be private. But even after all this, right, this is something that we are expecting users to have to opt in to do in theory. This is not the practice of what users actually are doing. In some cases, users will have to go through and do extra steps, but actually hoping that people will do them or at least expecting that people will actually do these things is completely different. Cryptocurrencies are speculative assets, and so most people approach it from a speculative point of view. We can't expect everyone who gets involved in cryptocurrencies to have the first thought be, I need to watch weeks of privacy videos to make sure I know what I'm doing before I make a transaction. That's just a bar that cannot be crossed except for the uh, extreme enthusiasts. It's not something that can happen in practice. So what do we actually see in practice, right? This is Zcash's transaction by type. Uh, Gareth Davies puts this together every month. Really shout out to him because he uh, is doing this completely free of any funding as far as I can tell. Um, so you can see there that 80% of transactions have absolutely no privacy uh, or no effective privacy at least on the Zcash network. Of course, Zcash offers the ability for users to either send shielded, non-shielded, or some form of in-between transactions. 80%, 80 to 90% of them on, in most months uh, have no privacy feature inv included whatsoever at, in any step of the transaction. And only about 4% of them, this you know, back in September, uh, included uh, features to make it similar to Monero, where it had the sender, receiver, and amount. Anything that's blue there, somewhere in the middle, is like a 
it's complicated, not really sure exactly how private it is, but I mean, it's, it's a really long conversation. So we can see here, in theory, Zcash has a wonderful privacy feature available to users. But the practice is no substantial number of users take advantage of this feature. So Zcash, for its entire history, has been plagued by a substantial mismatch between theory and practice, where on the cryptography side of thing, they have developed this excellent solution. However, n very few people use it, and they've had setback after setback in terms of actually trying to get privacy realized in practice. So let's talk a little bit between the differences between privacy and coin equality or fungibility, right? Let's fight, right? So privacy is obviously something that, you, that allows users to hide, you know, from someone or something. It depends on whatever their use case is. They're hiding for whatever the sake of meeting their use case. And the privacy um, is effective based off a few things. Um, you need to worry about both the effectiveness and the implementation of those privacy features in order for you to care, right? You both need to matter. If a privacy feature is very ineffective, but it's implemented broadly, well, in that case, you're probably still not getting privacy out of it, really, or, or at least, if, especially if it doesn't meet your use case. However, if there is a really effective privacy solution that, you know, on paper could meet your use case, you need to make sure that it still also meets your use case in practice. That's hence why the implementation also matters. Now, coin equality is a little bit different, and this is really exciting. It's very interesting, right? Coin equality is the idea between transaction and output, or perhaps if it was on some address-based currency, an address, um, uh, indistinguishability. So it's the idea that one output or one address or one transaction looks the same as any other. Now, the interesting thing here is that since there is no extreme in terms of what fungibility, like you can never have exactly perfect fungibility every single way just based on you knowing when people send transactions based off their time, for example, the implementation of the privacy feature matters more than the actual quality of the privacy feature, so long as the privacy is good enough such that you cannot do mass surveillance on the network, and so it meets the use case of you avoiding mass surveillance, coin equality is far more dependent on the implementation of that feature everywhere than it has to do with you know, anything above just mass surveillance protection. So this is really, really interesting. You know, in Monero community, we talk about the importance of fungibility and the importance of privacy, but ultimately fungibility, at least fun fungibility in practice comes across only if you have protection against mass surveillance. That's the bare minimum you need to have of privacy in order to have good enough fungibility in practice in most cases. Everything else more so falls under the privacy category. And of course, we'll do our best to make sure fungibility is actually held up to a higher standard than that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, fungibility should be an easier goal to achieve than privacy. The difference is every other project really struggles with implementation. It should be low-hanging fruit to get fungibility, but no one else does it, and it's really odd. So let's talk about some of the uh, privacy requirements, right, to illustrate this. In order to have good enough privacy for whatever use case it is, of course, the use case being, you know, perhaps you're trying to make a certain type of purchase, or maybe you're just trying to avoid mass surveillance, you know, whatever it might be, you need to worry about a huge variety of things. You need to worry about the transaction graph, the timing, the networking, the metadata, the amount, the other users' behavior, and a whole host of other things. And attackers get stronger and stronger at trying to break these things down. Use this information to your detriment over time. For coin equality, though, you just need what I'm going to call good enough privacy, right? It needs to be pretty good where it needs to take someone a lot of effort. They can't realistically look at everything. And so when you make a purchase with a payment processor, for example, they're going to look at your money and be like, eh, it's, it's fungible enough, right? That's the weird, that's the way life works. It's far more important that it actually is implemented everywhere than it is that the privacy is to a perfect extent. And that's one thing that's very weird. 
over a year ago now, I did a coin equality exercise at a conference. I gave all the attendees who were there in person, you know, one of those. And uh, I gave all these attendees a note card and I had them write on the card a list of transfers. So Justin perhaps would send money to Diego. Diego would send money to Doug. Doug sends money to Alice, let's say. So everyone wrote down these transfers on a card to help replicate a ledger. And then after people had done that a few times, I said, all right, this one person is now considered bad. You're going to put a little red dot next to their name. And now you need to keep exchanging cards. Well, this was really, really interesting because people refused to accept some of the cards with the red dot on it, probably because in this case, they didn't want to be called out at a conference and have to answer a question. But in real life, the stakes are usually a lot higher. So what happened? Well, people avoided the tainted cards. If there was a red dot on them, they did not want these cards. Some people would only accept them for a little something extra, right? Where they needed a little, an extra conference sticker. They needed, you know, something else. They wanted, that they needed something else to push them over the edge. In real life, this could be, you know, perhaps accepting the coins only at a premium. People said that they would be willing to accept or to like uh, pay a premium for a fresh card with no one's name on it, or even cards with fewer people's names on it, so they had less exposure. And then, of course, in reality, who among the attendees would actually pay for chain uh, analysis software that would identify which dots are red? You can look at a blockchain and see what addresses transactions are associated with for Bitcoin, but you don't have access to the databases held by people like Elliptic, Chainalysis, CypherTrace, BitFury, Crystal, right? They, they all have their own indexes of how they identify risky addresses. And you're not paying for that. So how are you supposed to know as a regular user, right? So ultimately, this is a substantial issue. Coin equality fungibility is substantially important for everyday finance. And it's interesting how in this conference example, I was able to illustrate to people why it sucks to interact if you are going in without any understanding of about where the risks actually are, but you know perhaps an exchange would. You are you ha you're you're participating in the network with no knowledge when uh, regulated institutions do have knowledge because they need to pay for it. So what's the reality here? Well, chain analysis companies will most likely mark the use of any optional privacy as higher risk. So this is why you need to have privacy well implemented everywhere, because if there's a niche optional privacy use feature, the most likely case is that they're just going to mark the use of that feature as high risk. It's an indicator of high risk to use a privacy feature. However, the difference is if you are accepting a Monero deposit, it's the same as accepting any other Monero deposit. If you are accepting a Zcash deposit, all else equal, uh, the FATF, other regulatory guidelines say that it is higher risk to accept a shielded transaction than it is to accept a transparent transaction because you're able to conduct a little bit extra risk analysis on that transparent transaction. And many, many tools, uh, there are public announcements that they do this, will mark optional privacy features, for example, mixers or Z addresses or private SAN, Wasabi Samurai, the whole like as higher risk. So you will get a little red dot next to your name. Also, you can't just mandatory mine to a shielded output. It doesn't fix the problem because um, you can't just say, oh, well, all money in the past was tainted at some point. They truncate it at the time it was last at the exchange. So it's basically, what does the history look like since the last time this money was held by a regulated institution? They don't care about the history before then. So no, it does not work to just try and taint everything as, as people sometimes say, oh, we'll just taint everything. Then they can't do anything about it. Yeah, that's not effective in practice. Um, and then of course, the main takeaway here is that optional privacy often harms fungibility, not helps. And this is the ironic part, right? Fungibility in part requires you to have privacy implemented such that you can have transaction indistinguishability. But if you only somewhat implement a privacy feature, you are in fact introducing a new way to distinguish transactions. And so therefore it harms fungibility. It doesn't actually help it. Isn't that weird, right? So let's talk about defense and numbers. We have two options for networks here. 
Option one, which you can probably tell based off the color, hint, hint, hint. Um, there are thousands of people who have basic privacy protections without caring too much about those protections. Most of the users of the network don't even care about privacy. They may only care about trying to avoid mass surveillance. They're not worried about being specifically targeted by someone with a substantial number of resources. And then option two, you have a very small number of experts who meticulously seek ideal privacy. Let's see which one of these plays out better in practice, if you have, in practice. So the Monero way versus the opt-in way is you're kind of, we're probably getting at. So in the Monero way, everyone has basic protections. The exact protections that are provided by Monero, in some cases are really, really good, but in other cases, they're good, but not perfect. They are great against mass surveillance. They may fall apart against certain targeted surveillance methods. If you want to learn more you, on this channel, there's the Breaking Monero series. I highly encourage you to watch those. On the opt-in way, well, really only about 1% or less of people have any privacy protections at all. Zcash is great. It's 4%. Oh my gosh, right? So this is really problematic because you can't just have people that are really, really interested in going through convoluted steps actually getting any privacy at all, especially when the alternative is just complete transparency. That's quite ridiculous. So these, and this is shown based off who the users of these networks are. So for Monero, who actually uses the privacy feature or who uses Monero, right? <laughs> well, they're privacy fanatics that use it, obviously. There are researchers, but it also includes things like crypto nerds, speculators who don't even care about the privacy, miners who might be mining Monero because it's the only coin they can mine with their CPU. They may have no idea that Monero offers privacy, but they still get privacy from transactions, and they contribute to the set of people who are using privacy features. And then also, of course, just everyday users who are buying and selling goods. However, if you have an opt-in privacy system, really it's only reduced to privacy fanatics and researchers. The user experience of using these opt-in systems it is usually too high. The fees are expensive. The cost is expensive. Um, you need to wait a while. You need to have special wallets. You need to spend a lot of time figuring out what you're doing. It's just a total pain. And so you can see how, as a result, the users of the privacy system for Monero are far more comprehensive than they are of a normal opt-in like privacy feature use. So what are the results of defense in numbers? Well, Monero provides more privacy to more users than any other cryptocurrency project. And I'm going to show some numbers to back that up. And the benefits are especially to those who do need the privacy. It's not just about people who are getting privacy because it's awesome and they just, you know, cool, fun perk, I don't really care. Those users exist if they're mostly speculators, right? At the end of the day, they're just chasing a buck. Well, they're not, not only are they getting privacy, but also those who do care about privacy, those that are the privacy fanatics, they have a much broader, more flexible playground to play with when you have more users involved in this system. So let's compare the comparative number of transactions hiding the sender, receiver, and amount for Monero and Zcash. Monero is you know, dark orange. Zcash is sort of this, this pale color here. Well, you can see for really its entire history of Zcash, um, really only the first two months when Monero had not yet implemented Ring CT. So Monero was not hiding the transaction amount yet for those two months. Uh, Monero has completely swept. Like it, it's just not even close. Monero has, you know, la last month had over twenty times the number of transactions that hid the basic information at all. You know, and, and for Zcash, the alternative is mostly we reveal all of this information. That's that's what happens with the vast majority of their transactions. So you can see that focusing on implementation, uh, implementation, sorry, really does have substantial impacts on how users actually get privacy. This is realized privacy here. If you want to see what the actual adoption of a privacy feature is, look at the adoption of that feature, not just a coin where someone's actually using the transparent version of it. That doesn't make any sense. That's not adoption of privacy. That's adoption of transparency. It's the same status quo. It's literally a fork of Bitcoin, right? So you can see compared to its most common, you know, considered coin counterpart, Zcash, it's, it's truly not even close. 
Now, I'm also going to compare it to Samurai and Bitcoin, and I wanted to really, really stress that reader beware, right? There is no actual direct comparison between the numbers I'm going to be comparing, <laughs> and I'll explain why I'm doing this, but I want to go through a bunch of caveats. You cannot directly compare the number of Samurai mixing rounds and the number of Monero transactions. They are not directly comparable, but I think when you look at the results, you can see how the vast differences will overcome any sort of ambiguity in the results where you need to be careful. The numbers are so different that these direct comparisons don't even matter. So here is most recent data from Whirlpool. Uh, Matt Adele puts these together. Obviously, he's a very strong supporter of privacy in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, you can see that in the maximum month, um, Samurai had 9,631 mixing rounds in a month. Maybe that's higher. Uh, I mean, perhaps a bunch of people send funds today and maybe they change that. Who knows? But as of uh, as of you know today, this is the most number of mixing rounds they've had in any month, 9,631. So a few caveats before I go through anything else. One, Samurai has three different mixing pools. You cannot just combine the three of them together into one big number like I did there, 9,600. You cannot do that. You can identify mixes per which pool they use. So therefore, that's a critical piece of metadata. You can't just simply add them up. So this is actually ne you know, negative in Samurai. Uh, for, for, sorry, negative in the comparison for Samurai, Samurai. Also negative for them, the amounts are transparent. So you do know how much is being mixed. Uh, with Monero, you do not know what amount is being mixed. So if I go back you know, two slides to this chart, really 0% of transactions would qualify here from Samurai because they don't actually hide the uh, amount to the extent that Monero and Zcash do. Even so, and then of course, sorry, um, last point I need to make too is that Samurai mixing is an interactive process. Monero transactions are non-interactive. With Monero, when you send one transaction, it is one user sending one transaction. With Samurai, it's many users that are sending this transaction. They're working together to send it. So no, you cannot directly compare these numbers. But even so, Monero had 450,000 transactions in October that hit the sender, receiver, and amount, which is over 45 times Samurai's best. So what does this mean? Even after you go through a, well, a per user, per output, whatever, even if you were to try and take a more verbose analysis of this and try to get a better estimate, the main takeaway is there is far more evidence that suggests that Monero has more users, you know, provides privacy to more users than Samurai does to their network. And Samurai is a leading mixing solution. We get along really well. We we have many similar world philosophies and privacy philosophies that they do, right? But at the end of the day, because of the way it's implemented, Monero does deliver privacy to far more transactions, far more users of a system than the best estimates for Samurai. That's just the way it is because implementation is done really well. So you have users in the Bitcoin space that often say, you know, Bitcoin's where all the liquidity is, or perhaps they really will advocate for the adoption of Bitcoin privacy. Well, the fact of the matter is, a much smaller network, Monero, has well surpassed the privacy adoption in Bitcoin. And I do not expect this trend to slow down as Monero is better understood by individuals, as it becomes easier to use. Monero really has laid down the foundation that will allow it to retain the, you know, the privacy given to users if you try and compare them in any measurable metric, just because everyone will, who wants privacy will certainly prefer to hide in a much bigger crowd that is Monero. So how does this actually happen? What has Monero done to really make it so different than any of its peers? Well, Monero has done one really important thing. It has focused on improving the base level privacy achieved. And it has focused less on the maximum potential privacy someone can have. Monero contributors basically think, how can someone fuck this up, right? In what way can someone come in and fuck up setting a transaction? And we don't need to overcomplicate things. Just start with the obvious. Someone shows up to Bitcoin. What are some ways they can screw up sending a Bitcoin transaction to ruin their privacy? Well, if they just send 
a transaction with any old wallet that doesn't have any obfuscation at all, they're going to be screwing up. So what can you do? You take steps to make it so that they can't, you know, that's harder. Oh, the transaction amounts are public so people can see how much is in your wallet. That's a screw up. Well, how do we avoid that? We hide transaction amounts. Like start with the basic stuff that actually impacts people. And then you'll have the ability to focus on how power users can screw up and try to make life better for them later. Privacy will come to those who need it from the large pool of users engaging with privacy functionality. I say privacy will come to users who need it. Let's say, let's call those the power users, right? If you're a power user and really need the privacy um, and you need to be really careful and you're willing to put in a lot of work, you are going to have a much better time interacting in a system where the base level privacy is higher than a system where the base level privacy is effectively non-existent. If you are interacting with users who are by their own nature, already using privacy features, then it is no longer sketchy that you are using a privacy feature. That's amazing, right? That's totally amazing. And so you're able to use that and run with it. It's great for you if you do care about privacy, if you are a user that does deeply care about privacy. Power users gain more flexibility to do awesome stuff, and they get more volume just because there are more users that are participating with the privacy set. And then, of course, the real main takeaway is that far more users actually get the privacy protections that they need. If you are a miner and you're, you know, mining <laughs> and you receive a payout in Monero, no one else can see how much you made. That's a privacy protection you deserve. You should get that unless you want to make that information public. We can't also underwrite giving privacy for people who might not care about it in the moment. Like, they're assuming this privacy is there. They might not be adamantly in support of it but they're still expecting it for it to be there. And it's a win that we're able to deliver that privacy to people. I put this part in quotes here, but it says, this gives us the easy win of coin equality or fungibility first. I put it in quotes because ironically, like for Monero, it has been really easy, but for most projects, I don't actually see this being so easy. Monero has really been the only project that is focused on coin equality and has implemented everything widely. Other protocols have really struggled to implement things widely. It's not about coming up with some fantastic moon math and making it available to a very select number of people. Granted, that is awesome, but it's not hard to just take, uh, a, a, or technically difficult, to take an existing best of privacy solution and then just make it available for everyone. That should be the easy win, but very few people are doing that for a variety of reasons. Really, Monero has stood alone up to this point as one of the only major coins that has done this. So now let's talk about some hard truths. <laughs> this is the fun part of the talk. So first, transparent amounts are bad, right? It's effectively impossible to build a fungible and private asset where the base asset has transparent amounts. It's basically impossible. You're fighting such an uphill battle. It's effectively impossible. The amount transacted is a critical piece of metadata that is effectively impossible to work around. Let's look at Zcash, right? We have the idea where um, we can do a Quesnel analysis. I like to call it a just the tip pool use uh, just because I think it's more fun. But let's say a user takes their T address, they chuck it in the Z address, and they pull it back out to a T address. In theory, right, if you look on things just on a theory level, there is no on-chain record between the two on a transaction graph, right? It's broken, right? But... Since you just went in with just the tip, you instead have transaction amounts that are coming in, in and out on both sides. That's public info. Now everyone knows that money came in from here and went out there. They don't need a transaction graph to prove this, right? So this is an example where something with excellent privacy in theory, um, if everyone used the protocol appropriately, would not have to worry about this. But in reality, since transaction amounts are visible on both ends, it is very possible to learn a lot of information about many Zcash transactions, and there are research papers that estimate uh, and find specific transactions that have done this. So go ahead and look at that. Um, also, hard truth. Users are humans. They are not machines. They are not scientists in a lab all the time, right? Theory and implementation are identical in theory, right? Theory is in real life. So your implementation need to, needs to honor that users are not experts. Users in an open, permissionless network are going to bring a bunch of weird stuff. They're going to try and attack the network. They're going to do real dumb things. They're going to build tools that make absolutely no sense, right? 
So your implementation needs to honor this. It needs to understand that this is going to happen and, and it needs to be prepared for this. You can't blame users for not getting it. You can't say, oh, well, they just don't know how to do privacy. It's their fault. No, you made a shit protocol. Fix your protocol. Basic privacy protection should only be it uh, should be achievable by newcomers, not only newcomers, sorry, um, not only reserve, reserve for enthusiasts. And the enthusiasts are going to get benefit, like I said, because they have the newcomers that are holding their back up. It's great. I know a lot of people refer to the idea that you just need additional education to make it work, right? Oh, if people just learned more. Well, even though we can't dismiss education entirely, since advanced users with very advanced threat models, very specific threat models, will always need to educate themselves to stay ahead the bleeding edge of the attacks. Education is not the solution for over 99% of people. We cannot expect people to adopt a privacy solution where they really need to jump through a bunch of hoops. If it costs extra, if it takes extra time, if it removes some of their flexibility, they're just not going to do it. They will not do it. So, and then that, that's 99% of people where they just don't care. So we need to assume that they are not going to put in any effort to learn about how to get privacy and we need to give them privacy anyway. That's the really hard part. That's where implementation matters. Another hard truth, privacy is not perfect and we can't protect against everything. Not every threat model is solvable. We can't foresee every threat model. Even if we know what the threat models are, we might not have a great solution for them. And there will always be limitations in systems as attackers get stronger over time. These heuristics are going to get stronger and stronger over time. You've heard the thought that it's a cat and mouse battle. So you need to focus on uh, always researching and staying ahead of the attackers. But we need to continue this fight and we can't just ignore the broader threats in pursuit of the niche like niche ones right so we can't say oh well <laughs> or at least it's not very useful to say oh we're going to focus on the limitation of ring signatures in this very specific scenario if for some reason monero had transparent amounts right focus on the big stuff first solve the obvious problems then focus on the really tough stuff and Monero has done well because it seems to be the only one that's actually done that. Um, we need to design and build against risks that are most likely to affect the most people. So we build protections from the bottom up, not from the top down. Focus on what people are doing, figure out what the real user behaviors are, and then try to make sure that those are covered with reasonable privacy protections not start with building a privacy tool and hope that people use it. People are probably not going to change their behavior. You need to do your best as a protocol designer to meet them halfway. And then, of course, clearly communicate the strategy of building from the ground up and explain known limitations as you find them. That way, power users will be able to still be protected and they will know what the limitations of the system are. Monero has done far more than most other cryptocurrencies. We had the lovely breaking Monero series. Of course, I'm biased since I helped make it. But uh, it's a great explanation for what the limitations of Monero are. And we put those out there for all the power users who have stricter threat models than people who just are mining and think it would be cool to have a little extra privacy, right? So in conclusion, right, Monero offers far more privacy than any other cryptocurrency project, and it does this by focusing on implementation. Monero goes real hard in implementation. We don't just build a tool that we hope people will use. We built a tool that people are using, and we adapt the tool such that it is most useful by a large number of people. Monero focuses on the goals of coin equality and privacy for the masses. Those are the main topics. It's not just about privacy for one person that's really special. It's privacy for the masses, including the person who thinks that they want to be advanced because they're not going to hide unless they have a large number of users. Monero provides the crowd of people who are using privacy to make privacy the norm so that everyone can fit in Privacy is a never-ending battle. 
And those who take responsibility for delivering privacy, not just those who are making tools in a lab, will be best prepared to win this battle. Ultimately, what's the, at the end of the day, privacy is here to protect people against specific threats. So if we take responsibility for making sure that we are addressing these threats to the best extent as possible for the most number of people, then when a new challenge comes around, we will be best prepared to know how to address it. We know best what user behavior are. We know best how we can make sure that users are actually using privacy. That is critically important in making sure that these users are actually getting privacy delivered to them and having their threat model uh, appropriately handled. Privacy is all about accommodating for user behavior, not making an isolated experiment in a lab. All right. And with that, if you have any questions, let me know. You can get educated at masteringmonero.com or watch a film, Monero Means Money. That was, of course, the number one film in America for two days. Uh, you can get started at cakewallet.com. It's a common wallet. They did not sponsor this talk, but they're super dope. They're open source. Getmonero.org is the official main Monero website. And you can join the community. We recently launched a work group called Monero Space. You can join that at Monero.space or the hashtag Monero-space channel on IRC or the Matrix channel, also with the same name. Uh, there's also the Monero community work group, which is where this channel is on. Uh, and uh, tons of great talks there too. So it looks like there's a few questions that came up. I'm going to post on the acknowledgement slides here while I read it. So questions regarding esper experts who take responsibility for addressing threats. Is the number growing at a good rate in your opinion? I So I, I seriously do not think that uh, the importance of implementation has really hit the cryptocurrency industry very hard. Uh, I mean, the cryptocurrency industry has a culture of moving fast and breaking things, which in some ways is very good. Uh, but the problem is, like, it's the idea that, oh, well, something new will come around. So we can't focus too much on polishing the implementation. There's so much research that can still be done. We need to focus on those shiny research things first. When at the end of the day, people just want privacy. And, and I think that uh, people are slowly starting to acknowledge this. I would say that the the Zcoin team um, has somewhat acknowledged this. I think they have a, a larger uphill battle than perhaps they believe in making their privacy actually adopted by everyone but at least they have a plan. And the fact that they actually have like a plan to do it, not just a, well, we wish this would happen plan. That, that, that's not a plan. A wish this would happen is not a plan. Um, that alone is at least a step forward. And I look forward to other cryptocurrencies actually focusing on user adoption because I think that uh, people actually need to take advantage of these privacy features. They can't just be told this is something they can use. This needs to be something that they are actually using. Um, so yeah, yes, hopefully this continues to take off. All right, uh, transcript. Um, I'll, I'll post the slides at least. Um, transcripts, uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do. I, I know that transcripts are important for um, accessibility and things. We'll do our best to make sure there's a transcript available.